Hello, everyone. I'm Lana Zak. Thank you for joining me. On Friday, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention released its updated guidance for safely reopening schools. President Trump wants schools across the country to fully reopen this fall. But on Thursday, he announced that Jacksonville, Florida, at least that portion of the Republican National Convention, will be canceled because of health concerns. Natalie Brand is at the White House with the latest. The new CDC guidance for school reopening says a key consideration for administrators should be the spread of COVID-19 in communities. The decision should be made based on the data and the facts on the grounds in each community. The guidelines recommend keeping students in pods and having teachers stay with that same group. They also advise keeping broader recommendations such as social distancing, face masks and hand hygiene. The CDC notes the virus poses a relatively low risk to school-aged children, but health officials concede there is still a lot that is unknown. We certainly know from other studies that children under 10 do get infected. It's just unclear how rapidly they spread the virus. While President Trump has pushed for schools to fully reopen in the fall, he's now acknowledged that districts in hot spots may need to delay, saying that will be up to governors. But the president is still pushing Congress to tie school funding in the next COVID relief bill to reopening. If schools do not reopen, the funding should go to parents to send their child to public, private, charter, religious, or homeschool of their choice. Let's not turn your public school into the next uh, big uh, germ factory. We don't need super spreaders in a community. We know what happens if you do this wrong because we did it wrong in Florida. The head of the country's largest teachers union also noted the president's decision to cancel the Florida portion of the Republican National Convention and said he should give children the same consideration. Natalie Brand, CBS News, the White House. For more on this, let's go ahead and bring in Major Garrett and Catherine Herridge. Major is CBS News Chief Washington Correspondent, and Catherine is CBS News Senior Investigative Correspondent. Major, looking dapper there, we'll get to that in just a second, but uh, I couldn't we heard agree the more. new CDC. <laughs> <laughs> and you always look lovely, Catherine. Uh, but Major, you. let's talk about these new CDC guidelines for reopening schools that are coming out at the same time that the president is canceling the Florida portion of the Republican National Convention. How is the White House squaring these two moves? Awkwardly. Look, there's a whole history behind this. And these CDC guidelines had been the work of the CDC alone and not been pressurized publicly by the president himself. <laughs> the public would be much more receptive to what these guidelines are. But the public has seen the president pressure, in his own words, at the podium and through his Twitter account, the Centers for Disease Control to make these recommendations as soft as possible and to emphasize what he's emphasized, the need to get back to school, which has, let us be fair, an important aspect of it for child development. Many children in lower income families receive their meals at school and there is a socialization process that's very important about going to school and there's a quality of education aspect going to school. So these are not recommendations that exist without any underlying foundation beneath them. They have a foundation beneath them, but they also have this overhang of a political motive of the president, because he knows economically, if the country does not go back to school this fall, parents are much more bound to be at home, unable to re regain fully their workplace environment and the economic productivity that may come from that. What does that do? That hurts the economy. What does that do? It hurts his reelection prospects. So there is an overarching political imperative behind this, and the public sees this. And in the state of Florida, where the teachers union successfully drove the Republican governor, Ron DeSantis, a President Trump acolyte, away from his demand that schools reopen fully, it just goes to show you that that has a political energy behind it. And when science hesitation and well-grounded risk factors are put up against that, the political motive backs away because it has to. So that's the atmosphere in which the CDC guidelines enter into. Had they not had any of this political fanfare around them, I think the public, teachers, parents and students would be much more receptive than they will turn out to be. 
Well, it is interesting because we have seen how the president has appeared to change his messaging on the coronavirus outbreak recently. He's held several briefings by himself after three months without them. Catherine, you interviewed the president just before these changes. Did you sense a, a difference in his tone or that they were coming from the conversation that you had? Well, Lana, in his interview with CBS News, I think President Trump seemed to tip his hand that he had a more open mind about the wearing of masks, and he said he was comfortable, okay, with the CDC guidelines. And when we asked him whether he would urge Americans to wear masks in an effort to push down this spike in cases, he said that was really a call up to the governors, but Americans should follow those guidelines and the directive that they receive from the governors. President Trump resisted the idea that his position on masks had evolved. He pointed to the fact that the guidance on masks has changed over time. But in part, as you recall, when the pandemic was first declared, Americans were discouraged from wearing masks in an effort to preserve the PPE, the personal protective equipment, for these frontline workers who needed it most. Right. I remember when everybody was gobbling up masks and you couldn't find any on Amazon or in your uh, your local supermarkets. Um, but that's very different from saying that people shouldn't be wearing Correct. masks, which we now know mm, is right. the prevailing guidance. Mm -hmm. uh, let's switch topics, because we have a lot to cover today. Major, I wanted to ask you about White House Press Secretary Kayleigh McEnany. She showed a profanity-laced video of Portland protests and said that it proved that the demonstrations there were not peaceful. Tell us more about what the administration's trying to achieve with what is, I think we can agree, an unusual move. It is an unusual move, and the first two Leaders of the Department of Homeland Security, both Republicans, Tom Ridge and Michael Chertoff, have said it is so unusual, it's not consistent with the underlying legislation that created the Department of Homeland Security in the first place. The president is using the Department of Homeland Security, their words, not mine, as a personal police force, possibly for a political motive. So the White House has been backtracking a little bit under this great scrutiny. What are you doing? What is the justification and why? So it has to try to tell the country, using the White House briefing, and whatever look-in audience there is for that, to say what's happening in Portland, and this is the case the administration is attempting to make, is different. It's different in kind, it's different in duration, and it's different in danger. And they're saying not all protesters in Portland, but some have a criminal intent, and they specifically want to target, damage, deface, and continuously attack, in their words, a federal courthouse. And that, they say, crosses the line. And therefore, you need to have some kind of federal protection for that federal courthouse if the local jurisdiction won't do it. That is the underlying justification. But there is no justification that they've been able to come up with yet for doing this with people in uniforms that can't be readily identified and whisking people into unmarked cars. That's also brought tremendous scrutiny and criticism of what's going on in Portland. But the case their White House is trying to make, and the administration more broadly, is there are some aspects of the Portland protest movement that's not about protests at all. It's about anarchy, violence, and criminality. And that must be dealt with if the locals won't do it. Now, there is, as the administration has often said this week, a difference between that federal law enforcement presence in Portland and where the president intends to send, and in some cases has sent it to other cities. That is supposed to be in cooperation with local authorities to deal with underlying and troubling criminal trend lines, separate from protest culture or protest movements. We'll have to wait and see if that, in fact, is how this bears out. That's how the administration is explaining it. Might you use the word advertising this federal presence? Possibly. <clears throat> but Portland is a unique case, and it is being closely watched because there are those who fear if this president finds what he wants to find in Portland, there is a phrase that's sort of attached to this, performative authoritarianism, that he might use that in other cities. No evidence of that yet, but there are fears about that. All right, Catherine, I couldn't tell if you were trying to get in on this conversation. I was going to ask you about China, but uh, if there was something pressing that you wanted to say, I wanted to certainly give you the opportunity to do so. No, I think we're good to um, move on to China.
All right. Well, you know I'm very interested in talking to you about the <laughs> tensions that have been escalating between the Trump administration, uh, administration rather, mm -hmm. and China. Uh, the U.S. ordered the Chinese consulate in Houston to be closed, and they've arrested uh, several Chinese researchers working stateside. In addition, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo is facing criticism from Chinese officials after he delivered a speech Thursday called Ch Communist China and the Free World's Future. Tell us what's going on here. I would encourage people at home to think about this as really having two tracks. The first track has been an intelligence track. And since this was declared a pandemic in March, the U.S. intelligence community has been working uh, very diligently to understand the origins of this virus and what information the Chinese Communist Party had and to what extent the leadership sought to downplay and minimize the threat from COVID-19 in the early portion of this year. As they have learned more information and confirmed more intelligence about essentially who knew what and when and what actions they took, what we've also seen has been this very public rollout, making a public case against the Chinese Communist Party. And it began with the National Security Advisor Robert O'Brien. Then it included the FBI Director Christopher Wray, who brought in, beyond the national security piece that O'Brien talked about, this espionage piece. And then also Attorney General William Barr addressed the responsibility, he said, of American companies dealing with China. And then this week, sort of the, the cornerstone, if you will, has been this speech from the Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo. Based on my experience working here in Washington, what they're doing is they're laying out the public argument for any future punitive action this administration will take against China. And that, I think we will learn, is based on intelligence that they have gathered in the last three months. All right. Uh, if you didn't know it, it's opening day for the San Diego Padres. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and everybody you know else, it. and everybody when else. Here, it's going to make sure you know it. <laughs> it is now a CBS N tradition. Uh, Major mm -hmm. Garrett wears the appropriate apparel, and oh, uh, we hope, as always, you'll give us your prediction for the Padres. But before you do that, I want to play something that you told my colleague Elaine Quijano on opening day last year. Oh, okay. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Let's talk baseball. As a lifelong <laughs> fan, Major, tell yeah. us what opening day means to you. Well, look, opening day is the beginning of the baseball season. For me, that's when all the cosmic things come back into balance in the entire universe. When Major League Baseball is played, everything is better in the world than it was the day before mm. opening day. Yep. I think That's you were true. wearing a tie last year underneath your, <laughs> your Padres gear, Major. Yeah. I, I was on the I North Lawn, so okay? Well. I was at the White yeah, House. There. There's, there's certain decorum that must be upheld, absolutely. <laughs> uh, I, I see that you don't feel the same need for all of us here at CBSN when you're reporting, I guess, from your own home. But um, I also no, I, I have wanna, an iron I pandemic sure. rule. The iron pandemic rule is this. <laughs> I don't wear a tie inside my own house. <laughs> I think that that's fair. I think we can all agree on that. Uh, you also have a new piece in your hometown newspaper, the Claremont Times, titled Take Me Out to the Mind Game. Tell us what you think about this shortened yeah. baseball season and your predictions for the Padres this year. Look, I love baseball. It does restore cosmic balance when the game is being played, but I have <laughs> deep, deep, deeply depressed misgivings about this misaligned, misshapen 60-game season Aww. and this expanded playoff format. I think it all feels forced. I think there will be injuries. There will be positive COVID-19 tests. Rosters are going to be disrupted. There'll be no fans involved. This all feels like something that is being driven by the desire to keep corporate revenue going to the league and to the teams. As I argue in the piece, it doesn't have to be this way. I would prefer that this entire season, as much as I love baseball, be canceled and the energies and and monies that Major League Baseball clubs have in their communities be fed back into those communities to support things like testing, schools, homeless shelters, food banks. I just don't think this season is going to work out very well. Uh, I know everyone is excited to have some pro sports back, but I think it's going to get worse before it gets better, and we're going to regret the idea of forcing a 60-game season that has no statistical relationship to any other previous season ever played by the major leagues. The playoffs will look warped. All of it will have an enormous, garish, ugly asterisk attached to it. As much as I love the game, I wish we weren't doing it. Hmm. Um, <laughs> I interesting. I'm a big bummer. Also... I know. I'm a huge, <laughs> huge bummer. As, major, as, as my on, son would say, more from you. As, 
As my son would say, Dad, do you have to harsh my mellow like that? <laughs> I do. Well, I hope to start a new tradition here at CBSN about hockey, because I have a sweet spot for the Toronto Maple Leafs and the Stanley Cup, of course. And let's hope things are back in balance by the time hockey season comes around. So, so Catherine, Catherine, the <laughs> next time we have a chance, you'll wear your sweater and I'll wear my sweater. Remember, <laughs> the hockey fans, it's not a jersey. You'll wear your it's uniform so much better than I could wear the Leafs, but that's okay. Well, Catherine, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, are you a Nats fan then, or, or do, you, uh, do you have a baseball fan, or are you strictly a hockey gal? I'm really kind of a hockey gal ever since elementary school. You know, I was a little bit of a high sticker, if you can believe that. Uh, during that period. Uh, <laughs> I believe it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but I love hockey. That's, we'll leave it right there. How's that? <laughs> well, I adore both of you. A Major Garrett, Catherine Harridge. <laughs> thank you both for joining. You bet. Of course. Thank you.